start. Uh, did everyone get the outline I sent? Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. Was that helpful or oh, was it great. too helpful? Very helpful, yes. Okay. Um, I'm gonna be, um, I, I'm, I, I've given you so much there. I don't know quite the best way to approach it except maybe just to kind of skim it with you um, and remind you of what's there. You'll remember that we did an introduction the first Tuesday night, and then we looked at Matthew last week, and we're looking at Luke, uh, the second chapter uh, this week. Um, and you'll notice that when you compare Matthew and Luke, uh, there are some similarities we'll talk about below, but uh, also quite different things. You know, Matthew has Herod and has a Magi and a star, for example. And Luke has uh, no star, no magi. He has shepherds and uh, <clears throat> he has uh, the manger uh, and so on. So there's some, uh, uh, there's some parallels as we'll see, but there are real differences between. Some would say that they're virtually contradictory. Uh, well, we, we, can, we can look at that and see. In part one, uh, Raymond Brown entitles this the meaning of the manger. And uh, he gives special significance to the manger in Luke, as we shall see. But he begins that by talking about the significance of the shepherd. Uh, note, and uh, he makes this note. Notice that you can read chapter one in Matthew, and it won't have a thing to do with chapter two in Matthew. And the same thing can be said about Luke, the first chapter. Um, he puts it this way, nothing in Luke 2, 1 to 40, or in Matthew 2, 1 to 21, presupposes anything that happened in chapter 1. Uh, his, his question, or his suggestion is that these may have been developed independently of each other, okay? We don't know that, but uh, when you see that kind of difference in two chapters, it makes you wonder. He also points to these striking parallels in Luke and Matthew, despite different storylines. For example, both Gospels have an annunciation to just one of the parents. In Joseph, it's to, I mean, in Matthew, it's to Joseph. And in Luke, it's to Mary. And then an angel of the Lord reveals the following birth. Although in Matthew, remember, the angel of the Lord appears in a dream. And in Luke, the angel of the Lord appears sort of presently with. So uh, note too that in chapter two, we're talking about Luke, a brief reference to the birth of the child at Bethlehem. Now that's a little bit of a question. Where does Jesus come from? Bethlehem or Nazareth? Which, and you'll see that there's some confusion there when you compare the two, uh, when you compare Matthew and Luke. Um, <clears throat> Now, but there's a parallel. The story in each of those two gospels focuses on the uh, divine proclamation of the messianic birth to an audience. Now for Matthew, it's to Gentile magi. And that's really important. Remember now, when you've got Gentiles showing up in a birth story, they're probably anticipating the fact that the church is gonna go grow primarily in a Gentile audience, uh, you know, in the second and third uh, parts of the first century, okay? Now, Luke is going to have uh, the angels appear to uh, Jewish shepherds, um, and each group is guided by the revelation to come to Bethlehem. So there are some parallels. So in both Matthew and Luke, the Christological insight of Jesus' identity as God's son, and remember we've talked about this both times previously, it's been moved back from the resurrection to conception and birth. And remember we suggested that uh, uh, Brown believes that folks in that time were convinced that Jesus was Messiah, Jesus was the Lord, Jesus was son of God. So they begin to think back. That didn't happen only at the Passion. It didn't happen only at baptism. It goes all the way back to, uh, to birth and to conception. So, uh, and both Matthew and Luke uh, seem to want to make that, that point. 
Uh, <clears throat> note too that there was proclamation following the resurrection procla proclaimed by preachers. I remember that third part of the first century where you've got the apostolic preaching going on in the church. This is uh, after Jesus is in the first third, the second third, the uh, apostolic teaching. And in the final third of the first century, you have the uh, writing of the gospels, for example, and some other documents. Uh, Paul, of course, was writing in the 50s. So, um, uh, but that in the form of letters. Uh, <clears throat> so that there, there is a proclamation of Christology revealed in chapter one. And in chapter two, you have the proclamation by a star to the, mass, to the Magi in Matthew and by an angel to the shepherds in Luke, okay? But both shepherds and Magi believe and worship. And in both cases, the Magi, they go away to their own country and the shepherds return to their field. Um, note too that Matthew and Luke both have a tendency to dramatize the Christology of the birth narratives against the background of Old Testament of the Old Testament, um, and this is mixed in with an anticipation of Jesus's ministry. Let's look at the way Luke does it. The center of the narrative in Luke is the proclamation to the shepherds and their reaction. Okay, two steps, verses one to five. The census. Now the census is Luke's way. I'm gonna put it this way. That's Luke's way of getting Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem. All right. <laughs> Um, and then in the second verses six to seven, Mary gives birth to Jesus, swaddles him, and lays him in a manger. Okay, there are the two steps. Now note, Luke, well, I just said this, Luke needs the story of the census because he believes that Mary and Joseph live in Nazareth. See, that's where he's different from Matthew, okay? Luke has to explain what they were doing, that is, in Bethlehem. And Matthew had the opposite problem. <laughs> uh, Matthew pictured Mary and Joseph living in a house in Bethlehem, and he had to explain why they moved to Nazareth instead of returning from Egypt to Bethlehem. So you get some interesting kind of variance there. Now, another thing about Luke, there are real historical difficulties about every facet of Luke's description and dating of the Quirinius census. Look at these. Uh, uh, there was no single census of the whole Roman Empire under Augustus. Didn't happen. Um, no evidence that a Roman census required somebody to go back to the place of ancestry. Uh, and Luke's connection, sorry about that lost apostrophe S, Luke's connection of the reign of Herod the Great um, in verse one, I mean, chapter one, five, and the census under Quirinius, Herod died in 4 BC, all right? And Quirinius became governor in Syria and conducted the first Roman census of Judea in AD 6 and 7, sometime after Herod has died, okay? By the way, when I put a number like 17 after something like that, that's the page number in Brown's book, if you ever get it and want to pursue that. Now, Luke, look, Luke speaks of an edict that went out from Caesar Augustus when Quirinius was governor of Syria, which gives the birth of Jesus a very solemn setting. Uh, and I love what Brown says here. Luke is hinting that the rip, ripples set forth by the immersion of Jesus in the Jordan would ultimately begin to change the course of the Tiber River in Rome. And that metaphorically does anticipate something that really did happen. Uh, well, what he's hinting at here is the cosmic significance of the birth of Jesus as well. And note the historic importance of Augustus. I think y'all know, know this, but the age of Augustus was said to be a time of great peace. Uh, he came into great fame. There was a proclamation of a glorious age of pastoral rule. And Augustus was called, notice this, the savior of the whole world. Now we're going to get at this here quickly, but an anticipate this a bit this way. When you've got somebody calling the emperor the savior of the world, 
any half alert Christian, and I think Luke and Matthew were, <laughs> um, they've got to challenge that one way or another. And Luke contradicts that. And uh, he, uh, he says, what he's saying here really is, Augustus is not the savior of the world. What he did was to provide a setting for the birth of Jesus. That's a radically different thing. Jesus is the savior of the world, not Augustus. Now, what's interesting about this is just a sideline. What's interesting about this is Luke in any number of place, places seems to go out of his way to make sure that people understand that Christianity is not a politically revolutionary group trying to overthrow uh, the emperor, you know, and Kunzelman was a scholar, oh, some years ago now, I think he goes back into the 19th, maybe early 20th century, I didn't look that up, so don't hold me to it, uh, but he basically argues that Luke's gospel is an attempt to say to Rome, we are no threat to you, and tries to cast the gospel in that kind of form. There has been a lot of questioning of that position, thinking it's too simple. I think one can say that um, Luke wants you to know that Christians are not politically, are not political revolutionaries in the sense of wanting to overthrow Rome. But he certainly does challenge the emperor in terms of the emperor being God or an idol or something of that sort, it seems to me. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> the birthday that marked the true beginning of a new time, when Paul's language that would be the new age, that took place not in Rome, says Luke. It took place in Bethlehem. Okay. And then <clears throat> let's say a quick word, as Brown does, about the, uh, the role of the census in Jewish history. King David, for example, in 2 Samuel, ordered a census and incurred the wrath of God. I mean, God sent a pestilence, says, uh, says the book of Samuel. And then the census of Quirinius in Judea in AD 6-7 provoked a rebellion. And that led ultimately to the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD, which was a major, major trauma for the Jewish people. Note, however, at the same time that Luke goes out of his way in the Passion account to insist, and this is what I've just been talking about, that Pilate three times acknowledged Jesus's innocence of the political and revolutionary charges against him, okay? And note, too, that in the birth narratives, the parents of Jesus are obedient to Quirinius's census. That's very important. That is not, well, we know that Luke is not reporting exact history here. But we also ought to hear that Luke is making a point, all right? When people start accusing Christians of all kinds of things, when he's writing in the 80s, maybe as late as 90, he's going to say, wait a minute, Jesus, Jesus's family didn't rebel against the tax. In fact, they traveled. They traveled to pay the tax. And that's when Jesus was born. You hear the kind of, uh, uh, he's really taking on a position that I suspect the early church confronted in the uh, in the second uh, third of the century. Note too the importance of the Old Testament as it becomes a very strong motif uh, in Luke, um, and Luke moves from the census to what Mary does after the birth, and Brown argues that it's not important so much the birth itself. In fact, he passes over the birth pretty quickly. I mean, some of you women who've had children and went through several hours of labor, <laughs> you read that one, that, that short sentence in Luke where Mary has the baby, uh, you wonder, uh, you, you, you might want to say that's just like a man to cover that so quickly. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, notice that Mary swaddled him in strips of cloth and laid him down in a manger. Uh, now, Brown doesn't think that, that the, uh, 
that being in a, you know, in a outside in a barn or a cave or whatever it was, was that big a deal. In other words, he doesn't make, Brown doesn't make a lot of uh, there being no place for them in the logics. But what he's interested in is the fact that the Lord, the Messiah, the Son of God, was laid down in a manger. And the reason for that is the symbolism of the manger. And if you go to Isaiah 1.3, he says, the ox knows its owner, and the donkey knows the manger of the Lord. But Israel has not known me, and my people have not understood me. So here you've got Luke proclaiming this Isaiah dictum um, that it has been repealed and that God's people have begun to know the manger of the Lord. Brown thinks that's the significance of that. Not so much that he was born, you know, outside, outside the lodgings, but that he was born in a manger, which is in a sense reprise uh, this Isaiah passage. <clears throat> And the fact that people are beginning to know the Lord. Now, Brown also thinks that the shepherds are not symbols of the common uh, man, as he says. He says, for Luke, David was a shepherd in the area of Bethlehem. And that's one of the significances of the story and the, and the shape it takes. And <clears throat> also the city... <clears throat> that Luke refers to as the city of David is Bethlehem. So uh, uh, Luke has shifted over to Bethlehem terminology. That that is, he shifted over to Bethlehem terminology formally applied to Jerusalem and Zion. Okay. So, and that language of go up usually applies to Jerusalem. If you've been to Israel, you know Jerusalem's up a pretty good altitude and you have to go up uh, to go to Jerusalem. Right. Now, notice too, a twofold proclamation of the Messiah by angels. The first one is, I announce to you, I'm sorry, I dictated this and I didn't catch all of the errors. Uh, I used to get all over my students about this. First, I announced to you good news of a great joy for the whole people. Born in the city of David. Remember, that's Bethlehem now for Luke. A savior who is Messiah and Lord. And note that this, says Brown, this echoes in style the imperial propaganda of Augustus. But Luke borrows the precise title from his accounts of early Christian teaching. And he references those in Acts, uh, two places in Acts. And of course, Luke, as you know, wrote both Luke, the Gospel of Luke, and wrote Acts. So Luke Acts is, in a sense, uh, one document. Now, the second angelic, angelic proclamation is of a different nature. Uh, and it's the canonical glory and excelsis uh, in 2, 13, 14. And notice that there are three other, was there a comment? There are three other um, uh, poetic canticles in the Lucan infancy narrative, um, the Magnificat, the Benedictus, and the Nunc Dimittis. Um, so a good case can be made that the thesis that Luke added these canticles after he wrote the main body of the infancy narrative and that they came to him already composed <coughs> from a collection of hymns sung by Jewish Christians in praise of what God had done in death and resurrection. What, what he's suggesting here is when you begin to look at these uh, gospels, uh, they weren't necessarily put together at one time. As he's already said, you know, the first and second chapter of both Matthew and Luke could have been put together, could have been written apart from each other, and then were joined together by Luke or perhaps a later editor. Um, and also here that um, you've got some of these uh, uh, canticles coming out of early church worship during that middle third that 
perhaps were incorporated into the gospel of Luke by that author as well. So, um, so no text, please, please, yes, comment. Uh, we really are, we don't know where they got, we don't know the source of their material, what their uh, references were or anything. We don't know if they interviewed people or if they found notes of somebody somewhere. There's no, no indication anywhere of where this information came from. That's right. Okay. That's right. And, and you know, their scholars argue about possibilities, you know, uh, like uh, there's a the belief that some of this came out of the worship experience of the church in the middle years of the century, you know, that middle third we talked about. Um, and it, it could have been written by Luke, but I don't think so. It sounds, uh, most scholars think it came out of that, that the worship services of the early church. Uh, Tex? Yes. Uh, I've also heard it suggested that this may have originated as a pageant and that it, then it got written down. That, and it reminds yeah, me oh. that we went to see a Christmas carol at KC Rep and every year they add more music. And in yeah. a way, that's kind of what, what's happened here. It, yeah. uh, they started with the basic story and then they add music to it. Yeah. Or, and yes, indeed, the, the, uh, the oral transmission, uh, we have talked about that in previous sessions, but the oral transmission is very, very important. And if you remember, Luke used some material out of Mark, used some material out of Q, and then he had material that was distinctively his own. In other words, it doesn't appear in Mark or Luke or certainly not John. And so uh, that could very well grow out of the part of that oral transmission that he was familiar with. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah okay um <clears throat> now look uh and then we're i think we're about done here i hope i haven't bored you to death by going through something you've got in front of you notice too that there is a twofold proclamation i'm sorry we just looked at that um the the place i wanted to go was the uh, reaction of three different participants um uh two the birth scene okay first you've got the shepherds all right and they find the angelic sign verified so you've got testimony from shepherds and they from angels in the lucan narrative and they symbolize an israel who at last recognizes its lord and glorifies and praises god for all they've seen and heard and then there's a second group of hearers who are astonished at all the shepherds report now astonishment is pretty a standard reaction okay but it can be negative as well as positive <laughs> all right uh, but in these infancy narratives uh, these hearers brown says uh, are like those in the parable of the seed who hear the word receive it with joy but have no Oh, root. Uh, that's have no roots. <laughs> you, you see that there? That's roots. I, my uh, my uh, dictation machine reads my southern accent rather unusually at times, and I don't always pick it up. All right. Third, then there's Mary, who kept with concern all these events, interpreting them in her heart. She's not above astonishment, but her hearing is more perceptive, all right? And so you can compare. Mary is the only adult in the infancy narrative who will last into the public ministry and even into the church. Now, I wanna remind you that in Mark, Mary and the brothers come to get Jesus because they're really worried about him. So I wonder if uh, Luke is trying to modify. You see, Mark has a pretty negative view of the disciples. And Luke does not. And you have that occasion in Mark where, where Mary and the brothers are really worried about Jesus. And that's nowhere in Luke. 
and he tends to want to portray the disciples in a very good light. I heard, I heard Lindsay Farragut say one time that there are places in Mark where the disciples look dumb as a snake. <laughs> and uh, 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 so you do have that kind of a problem. Well, there we have it. That's basically an outline of the, uh, of the document that you uh, had for today. And I think we can throw this open now and see what you want to do with it. Yes, good. Um, I picked up on uh, Brown's talking about the census and how they seem to be politically so loaded, but he doesn't say why is that the case? Why would it have made men angry? Why would it have made God angry? You mean in Samuel or in Luke? Uh, well, both cases, the census was a dumb thing to do, apparently. It caused problems. Why would it cause problems is, is not spoken to. You have any sense of that? I think Rome wanted it for tax purposes. Yeah. See, and, they, so they, and, and you know, information is power and oh yeah. dominating of people. I think Rome had a good many reasons for wanting a census, yeah. Okay. And yeah. people rebelled against that, yeah rebelled yeah and uh yeah. the one in samuel do you have any idea why god would have taken offense i don't know let's uh i don't um i'm trying to think back brought on a pestilence um it, uh, god didn't like it according to samuel and it did bring on pestilence um um yeah. let's see that's don't dwell uh, on it i just thought maybe you had some quick insight no I don't know. I, what I what I know I don't remember. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't check it. Yeah, and I didn't check it. Uh, what I once knew I don't remember. Um, let's see where where did we get that? That was Second Samuel and twenty four. Let me just look at that right quick. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, it's an interesting question. Go ahead. Anything else about that you want to raise? Uh, not that point. Uh, you you said also uh, one of the uh, gospel writers thought it was awfully necessary to make the setting clear for the birthplace of Christ. Uh, again, wh why was that? Well, I think you have So far as I can tell uh, from Brown, Luke does not have the problem of uh, Jesus being born in Bethlehem. Matthew is struggling with that. How did, how, how did we, uh, how does Brown put that? Um, uh, shepherd's twofold proclamation by the angel. Oh, no, I got to go back a bit. Uh, um, in chapter two with Luke, uh, Luke, where is it? Where does uh, Brown say Luke had no problem with the Bethlehem birth. Um, oh, it's where he talks about it just seems to have been, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Matthew uh, is struggling with that issue. I'm trying to quicker in the text. <laughs> trying to quicker in the text that I can in my. Uh... If anybody can find that place where Brown discusses it, do so. But. Um... <laughs> The uh, second birth of Jesus. Uh, yeah, here we go. Um, <clears throat> Joseph went from the town of Nazareth. You see, that's right. already the home. Okay. Yeah. In Galilee to Judea. Okay. Right. To the city of David. Now that's Luke's comment. Mm -hmm. To the city of David called Bethlehem. All right because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged, and who was expecting a child. So see, he's got, he's got them 
Nazareth is home. And they're going to Bethlehem for the birth in Luke. All right. Um, now let's look at Matthew right quick. Uh, wise men from the east. Da, da, da. Okay, now the birth of, of Jesus the Messiah. I'm sorry, I'm in chapter one now, uh, verse 18. Uh, Jesus the Messiah took place when his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph. They, had, they lived together, she found to be with child. Uh, Joseph, a righteous man, unwilling to expose her to public disgrace. Um, but an angel of the Lord appears to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, take Mary as your wife, da, da, da. And then going down, uh, had no marital relationship with her. And yes, then we get to uh, chapter two. Um, and the time of King Herod after Jesus was born in Bethlehem. So they've gone down from uh, Nazareth to Bethlehem in Matthew, okay? And that's where the birth is going to appear, the wise men, Herod, and so on, okay? Um, and then because of the threat of Herod, then they go into Egypt. And remember now that this is just paralleling the story about Moses in the Old Testament and also some parallels of Joseph in the Old Testament. So he's just harking back to the Old Testament, drawing the pattern there that characterizes also the life of Jesus. But the point is, <clears throat> uh, Bethlehem is going to be at this is going to be the place of birth for both of them. For for Luke, the question is, how did they get to Nazareth? Okay, um, back to Nazareth. Well, they were already in Nazareth, and they go down. Okay, to Bethlehem. In uh, in Matthew. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm confusing this tonight. Um, I'm trying to find the passage I want. I'm not finding. Um, I, I can uh, I can struggle with it between now and next week. It's, well, it's just here, interesting why they nail that so strongly. Here's the issue: they both got to get him in Bethlehem and in uh, and in uh, Nazareth, and um, and in one place uh, he's going uh, home to Nazareth, and in the other place uh, they're fleeing back to Nazareth from Egypt because they can't, you know, that's in Matthew because they can't, um, uh, they can't go back to, to Bethlehem because of Herod. Mm -hmm. That's what text, I, that's this what text. This is, uh, I, I mean, I, I'm not sure why we, I'm not too interested in that, but, uh, the question is they were doing this to, to try and show the lineage through the Jewish faith for Luke, right? And trying to paralyze, parallel some of the central stories of that faith, yeah. That was a, but, that was a but, but, uh, but Matthew didn't, when, he, when he's saying this, this is mainly gonna be going to the Gentiles, I thought one of them was saying, this is mainly going to be going to the Gentiles. If that's true, they wouldn't care if it went along it, with that. It's it's it, remember now. It's Matthew who has the uh, who has the Magi come. They're Gentiles. Yeah, See, the first Gentiles at an Epiphany. Right. Thing, where we will celebrate right. the uh, the Gentiles coming to Christ. Right. So that's uh, that's really um, Matthew's work there. Right. And, and uh, now what you've got in Luke is, I think, a couple of things. One of the things is that, you know, the shepherds come. They are Jewish Christians in, math, in, in Luke. And also you've got his constant reference to, uh, to uh, you know, to the rulers, to Caesar, 
uh, to Augustus, uh, Corinthians, and so forth, um, which indicates the uh, a challenge as to who truly is the uh, the savior of the world. So he does take on that on, and that does have Gentile implications because by then, I mean the the uh, the um, the success of the churches that the church is having with Gentiles is greater than the success that they're having with uh, Jews. Yeah, that's my point. I, yeah. I, I, I'm assuming since they're writing this and figuring out how this, how people should see this, mm -hmm. uh, one is wanting Israel to see it through the light, eyes of the Jewish faith. Why would why would Matthew want people to see it through the eyes of Jewish faith if he is moving, mainly doing thinking have in mind Gentiles? Well, in Matthew's case, remember what we were saying last week that Matthew um, is trying to make the point that the people who have the scriptures have not accepted Christ. And the people who don't have the scriptures are right. in Christ. So right. one of the things he's trying to do is make the case on the one hand in terms of the Old Testament, you know, that Jesus fits into that pattern of, okay. of David, son of David, of Joseph. See, the great, the great event of the Hebrew folks is the liberation of the slaves out of Egypt. I mean, that's, that is the right. central thing. Right. And so he's trying to connect this uh, with both Joseph, who led them into Egypt on the one hand, in the Old Testament, that Joseph, and on the other hand, the Moses who led them out of Egypt on the other. So uh, one way to demonstrate that one was Messiah was to show how uh, that one parallels these central uh, uh, stories of, uh, of liberation in the Old Testament. Yeah, I, I understand that, but my question is, if he's if he's going to the Gentiles, they don't they don't honor that story. So why is why is he pushing so hard on that story for Gentiles who don't know that story? Well, you see, in the by the time you get to ninety, yeah, the the uh, the Gentiles are the majority of the people in the church, right? Yeah, so I mean, uh, having a place for the Gentiles becomes pretty important in these birth stories. Mm -hmm. I th I, but Dallas I, is saying, what, yeah, Dallas is saying, but why would he care about the Jews then? Is that yeah. right, Dallas? Yeah. Yeah, that's well, what's puzzling. I think the way that he's demonstrating his concern, if you remember, is, and we did, we talked about this at the very end of Matthew last week, where Matthew talks about some accepting the gospel and others rejecting it. Yeah. But I think he would want everyone to receive it. I think he's convinced that finally everyone across all these lines will receive it because Christ is Messiah. He's son of God, son of David. But I think it is a problem for Matthew that the people who have the scriptures aren't accepting Jesus. And that's why he's using, one of the reasons, I think, why he's using scripture. That makes sense? Uh, uh, maybe. <laughs> we can go on. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I mean, we're now at the time to talk. So, you know, yeah. Let's, yeah. let's do it. Well, I don't, I don't want that. other people need to talk. Yeah. What kinds of questions, comments uh, do we have? Uh, let, me, let, me, let me turn it around. Dallas, I heard you say maybe. So what's your alternative thought? No, no, I'm just saying, I, I think other people need to have something to say about this. I've carried this along far enough. Well, it's an uh, awful fruitful thing to talk about. I never let that bother us. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm fine. Did anybody pick up anything in the outline itself that you wanted to pursue more? Uh, greater detail. 
Was the outline helpful? Is that worth doing? Was it I think too, so. Was it too abbreviated? No. Okay. Uh, the reason I say that, uh, I got Brown. I think it arrived last Sunday. Oh, oh, good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I find it so dense. Yeah, it that, is. Uh, you you just can't read it and get it. Uh -huh. And uh, the more you can break it out, the more it, oh, okay, I kind of begin to see now. It it <laughs> It is a scholarly condensation, if I can put it that way. <laughs> yeah, it's a condensation of 750 pages. Right. <laughs> you, uh, if you hear that, yeah. Um, so for me, breaking it down any part is always helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, here, here's the here's the part of the outline I was trying to find and just couldn't find it quickly. But note that Luke says Brown. Luke needs the story of the census because he believed believed that Mary and Joseph were already in there, Nazareth. Okay, their own city, as he says in chapter two thirty nine. And what Luke has to explain is what they were doing in Bethlehem, all right? Matthew had the opposite problem. He pictured Mary and Joseph living in a house in Bethlehem, and he had to explain why they moved to Nazareth. Hear the point? That's what I was trying to, that's the yeah. comment I was trying to find. Yeah. Explain. It, uh, I, I hope when we look at John, it's going to fill this out in the meaning. I mean, this to me is arguing over uh, I don't know. It, it, it seems like it's it, it, it's I don't know what his point is in doing this is the question. Well, um... Let me let me try to see if I can say it this way, and I, I'm, I'm and I'm not trying to do a trap here. I'm I'm really trying to see if we can think in the logics and the idiom of that time. What would what would make something powerfully persuasive to you, Dallas? And just in terms of where you think about most anything, what would be say? For now, just give me one or two things that would make something really make sense to you. Uh, would be powerfully persuasive, not less the not necessarily theologically, but what would what would you turn to? Oh, well, I, I would return turn to the research, yes. Uh, yeah. But my, I, I guess what he's trying to do is to, for us to see why they said it was powerful. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. So, but then the, in doing that, he's, he's saying that if we read this and see that they see this as powerful, it helps us in our faith journey. Is that is that the point, or is it an intellectual thing for us? Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Let me. Uh, well, that's hopping. Uh, let me say two or three things about it. First, in that world, they didn't do research that way. Um, the research that uh, I think would have been important to Luke would have been the Old Testament. Remember, the New Testament did not exist. Right. So that if you wanted to prove a point, you would have to show how something now was uh, compellingly consonant with what was going on then. All right. And so yeah. what he's trying to do is to develop the notion in contrast to Augustus that Jesus really is Messiah Son of God, another name they use for uh, Caesar, and um, the um, the Savior of the world. So he's trying to say that, hey, Augustus is not the Savior of the world. Christ is. How do we know that? We know it several ways. First of all, we know it because angels, angels actually told uh, shepherds, Jewish shepherds, that... Uh, that Jesus was the son of God, the savior of the world. 
And secondly, he was born in the city of David, Bethlehem. And, uh, and thirdly, um, the, um, the heavens were singing. Now, there wasn't a star in Luke, but he talks about these angels showing up and all of a sudden they're singing. So in that sense, you have not only these parallels with the Old Testament, but you also evidence coming from nature itself. Right. Jesus is the son of God. So he's making that case in the idiom of that time and the logics of that time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and what he's trying to do theologically is to say, hey, Jesus didn't become Messiah or Savior at baptism, didn't become Savior at crucifixion and resurrection, but re actually was Savior from the time he was conceived in Mary's womb. And, 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 you know, an angel talked to Mary. That's compelling argument in that world. Yeah. Think about uh, it. Another way. How would you? Make well, I understand that perfectly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's not an, and that's not an issue. Okay. Well, what is the issue then? The, the issue for me is the writer of this book mm -hmm. is pointing all this out and it was helpful intellectually for me to know some of this, uh -huh. but it, is, he, is he pointing this out that we need to know this intellectually to help our faith journey now to make it more authentic, make it more spiritual, make it more what? I mean, why is, why is he doing this book? Well, I, I, because he thinks Jesus is the son of God. Okay, so he's, he's doing this to help bolster that, that argument from the, from the scriptures. Uh, yeah, oh yeah. Okay. And, and that's, his, that's his form of evidence. Okay. You know, in a, in a thousand years, uh, I'd be willing to bet my ball glove that what we find compelling as evidence, or what people find compelling as evidence a thousand years hence will be quite different from what we find compelling now. Yes, I agree. Yeah. So that, so that, the that, other thought is that wasn't written for us. No, it that was, was written for them. Written for them. That was written for them assuming it would carry throughout the millennia, but it was written in that context. Right. I would think that Luke would have believed that Christ would return far sooner yeah. than he has. Tex? Yes. I, just one thing. I think for me, um, and I may have this all backwards too, but uh, for me, it's important to remember that the gospels were written much late much much mm -hmm. later than when the events actually occurred mm -hmm. and so i like hearing the the differences and why there were differences and if you think about it that they were written by probably two different people trying to explain things that were important to them but i think it's important for me to remember too that they that these weren't written at the time these things were happen happening they mm -hmm. were written much later and um you know mm -hmm. that it was um people in the church that really decided of the leaders of the church that decided what was going to be included, what wasn't, and um, the things, because they were written by two different people, there are going to be differences, and, uh, but it doesn't make the events, because there were different, any less uh, magnificent, if that, does that, I don't know how to put that any other way, but. Um, and well, I think that's a pretty good way to put it actually um yeah uh, the way i well 
first of all, when you talk about God and the action of God, I finally don't know how to do that, except in story. Um, uh, for, or for example, when we sing a song like Breath of God, well, you know, that's, a, that's metaphoric, clearly. Uh, uh, if we uh, attempt to tell the story of Christ as the revelation of God, how do you do that? And actually, Luke is an extraordinary writer. I mean, his, his Greek is the best Greek in the Gospels. Uh, Marx is the worst. <laughs> and uh, I mean, he's a very, he's a learned man, uh, writes beautifully. I mean, that story, you know, and, and Luke too, is just wonderful, I think. And... Um, uh, the uh, I would say it's poetic and marvelous, you know. So when I'm when I'm talking about differences between Matthew and Luke, and I'm not so much trying to I'm not trying to deconstruct the stories as to try to understand. <clears throat> how the story took the form it did, what he's trying to do in terms of proving that, you know, Jesus is uh, savior of the world. Um, and, and I like to get to the place where I can bathe in the, in the idiom. You know what I mean? I mean, just swim in the idiom, enjoy, love the idiom. Uh, uh, um, I, love, uh, I love my fair lady. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I love the song, you know, on the street where you live, you know, I have often walked down this street before, but the pavement never left my feet, but my feet never left the, uh, how's that going? But the pavement never left my feet before. I'm, I'm, I'm several stories high, knowing I'm on the street where you live. Well, none of that is literally true. And yet I love that. I love that song because of the, well, what it makes me think about Peggy Sample, <laughs> you know, uh, and, and I can't improve on it, you know, uh, and when you get into the majesty and the mystery and the grandeur of God, uh, how better to talk about the birth of Jesus than as Luke does. Now, Matthew's telling is a lot darker picture. You know, that's a tough story. Um, and I think each of those really has something very important to say. So, you know, that's why I love Christmas and I love the narratives. Um, are there historical literary problems? Yeah. But I think it really speaks to the uh, Christ as a uh, savior that matches my experience in some way. Let uh, me tie into that just a moment. Mm -hmm. um, for those of you, some of you know already, Tex and I grew up in the same little Methodist church. And uh, what they taught us was properly called today dogma. This is the way it is, the way, the truth, and the light, and do not question it, period. And so I clung to that a long time, and as the years rolled by, I found it less and less compelling, something about it uncomfortable. And I remember clearly the first time I heard the census idea and the birth of Christ just could not technically historically be possible now you know that's heresy plain and simple heresy and it shook me up a little more than a little and and i've come to the point that texas articulating here that uh first he said about their research then versus our research now think of these fellas uh in the second and third parts of the uh, first century and the information they had available, truly believing 
in Christ as God incarnate, how do I record and put together all of this background? And they did it the best they could with the information available. And as Tick says, sometimes a story helps explain a possibility about how something occurred when you don't know exactly. Mm. And so that's the way I look at it because my faith is not shaken by these things that some people call discrepancy. I'm still looking for uh, the text, the, the street on the street where you are. I wanted to use the word rapture mm. expressed. Yeah. Uh, I find the rapture still there in these stories. Hmm. Yeah. I, uh, I don't know that that's an answer, Dallas, to the kind of question you're raising, but it's, uh, it's how I've come to uh, deal with these. Well, it helps me understand what, uh, what he's doing. In my mind, uh, it, it's it's kind of dealing with the and I don't want to get in this deep, but the the that Jesus was what he was what he was at his crucifixion, which they, they didn't know any. They changed their mind about Jesus after the resurrection, and now they're going back and reconstructing. Mm -hmm. What they're reconstructing is that he was this savior even before he was conceived and and that's a storyline mm -hmm. it's there's another storyline that jesus grew into uh this and and so that storyline is different from their storyline now luke does that with the uh, you know jesus going to the temple and so forth yeah yeah. So, so Luke, Luke wouldn't say that Jesus was the savior of world uh, uh, at conception. He would say he became the savior of the world at conception. No, I'm just saying if Luke would Luke say Jesus grew into that role. He might, he might, you might be able to argue that he grew, but I think the whole point of the birth narrative is to take uh, Jesus, uh, uh, to take Jesus's saviorhood back to conception. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Bob, you had a comment? Yeah. Um, to me, that brings up the question about who was Jesus and Christ and one theological position is he was both human and God at all times. And this growth you're raising, Dallas, is about his coming to grips as a human with his divinity and uh -huh. the growing sense of that. It's his discovery that's going on there. Yeah. Uh, that that explains it for me. And yeah. like all of this in the end, you know, make no difference. It is what it is. And I choose to believe. And the rest of it is you talked about intellect. This is my intellect working, picking up bits and pieces here, uh, like a big uh, jigsaw puzzle, trying to put them together. And uh, I don't see anything in here yet that uh, gives my faith any problem. In fact, I need something to jack it up from time to time because I don't feel like I'm measuring up. Uh, if you go, for example, into chapter 2, uh, verse 39, 40 there, uh, this is after Jesus is uh, presented in the temple. Luke says, uh, the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. So you do have the possibility in a text like that of talking about Jesus growing. Uh, and at the same time, you have in the chapter two, uh, I'm thinking now of the birth narratives and so on, 
where he's really taking Jesus's uh, Jesus's Messiah back to to uh, conception. Those are not necessarily contradictory. Uh, I I don't want to belabor the point. You know, yeah. I I go I ahead. My, I have my ahead, it's well, fun. <laughs> well, it's not fun. It's keeping people about 20, 15 minutes late. So uh, oh, we're, we're over time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and and I have you know I have my beliefs sure. about this whole thing, and so I. I I'm not sure this is the 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 uh, time to talk about all of our different beliefs in this. So uh, well, we, I kind of I apologize for getting us off off the point here. Well, I don't I don't think you got us off the point, but no, uh, I don't know. Have comments? Uh -uh. Right on. We we well, are we are beyond the hour. Uh, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Dallas. Oh, I I just want to make sure that in this forum, we, we have a way of everybody participating. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are several people not participating. So I, I think that's a concern. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there a final comment by anyone before we close for the evening? I'm looking forward to the, to the John narrative. I will get I think that I think that helps me help at least uh, kind of tie everything together. Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. Okay. It's a radically different gospel. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Any other comment? All right. Well, go in peace and may the God of peace go with you and